So our, our next talk is by Sanjit Seishia, who's a professor in the electrical engineering and computer sciences at UC Berkeley. Uh, his research is in full methods for dependable and secure computing. He's made uh, important contributions in a variety of areas uh, within formal methods, in particular, uh, for example, the satisfiability modulo theories work uh, was just recognized with the CAV award uh, not too long ago. Uh, and more recently, he's been focusing on the areas of cyber physical systems, uh, computer security, robotics, and in particular, machine learning, which he's going to talk to us about today. Sanjit, uh, take it away. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. And uh, do you see my slides in full yeah. screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to, to speak here. And thanks for Daniel for that kind of introduction. And uh, thank you all for, for being here today. Um, so at the outset, I, I just want to say that this the, uh, the topic of my talk today is something very close to my heart, uh, applying formal methods to uh, machine learning and more broadly AI-based systems, which is a topic that uh, uh, my group has been working on for about a decade now. And uh, today's talk really focuses on the specification side of it. Um, and at the outset, I should also say that um, it, it is perhaps not as closely connected to hyper properties beyond trace properties as some of the other talks in the session are. Um, and, uh, and so I asked the organizers about this at the, at the beginning, but you know, they really wanted me to speak on this topic. So, so here goes, but I'll try to point out the connections to hyper properties uh, as we go along. Um, and also you can find more about this topic at this URL here, learnverify.org slash verified AI. So the context here is this growing use of uh, machine learning and AI, as we are all aware, is particularly in uh, safety critical systems. Um, in, the, in the area of autonomous systems, uh, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars are a very visible example of this, where uh, machine learning and deep learning in particular is used in a variety of tasks in the autonomy pipeline. And this is only projected to grow over the next decade. At the same time, there are growing concerns about safety. There have been numerous papers showing that you can uh, cause deep neural networks to do bad things. Um, and there have been, unfortunately, accidents, including some fatal accidents that uh, may potentially involve the failure of AI ML based uh, systems like perception systems. So uh, the question that my group has been concerned with over the last many years is, uh, can we address the design and verification challenges of AI and machine learning based autonomy using formal methods? Um, and I think this is the tool that uh, pretty much all of us in this workshop uh, are focused on. So as an example of the kind of systems, I want to introduce one um, uh, uh, example of the type of systems we're looking at. Um, this is an automatic emergency braking system, uh, AEBS, in an automobile, uh, which uses deep learning for perception. This is an example we introduced in a paper published about four years ago. So imagine you have an autonomous vehicle. It has a camera mounted in front of it. Um, and it, let's say that the vehicle is, is in this very simple environment of driving on a straight road in the middle of a desert, one lane in each direction. So that's the kind of uh, picture that, it, that the camera captures that goes into a deep neural network. The job of this neural network is simply to detect whether there is an obstacle like a car in front or not. Um, and that it passes that uh, to a controller, a conventional controller, which then controls the plant, which is the vehicle dynamics. Uh, the vehicle, this then causes the vehicle uh, uh, state to change, which interacts with its environment, and that loop produces the next sensor input. Okay, so that's an example of uh, where deep learning is used for perception, uh, not for control. Uh, so the goal of the system is to break when an obstacle is near to maintain a minimum safety distance. Uh, over the years, we have created many models of the system um, in uh, software in the loop simulators, starting with basics MATLAB Simulink, all the way to more full-featured self-driving simulators like Carla. And like I said, the, the focus on this example is on the deep learning for perception. We've used a variety of neural networks um, over the years. So keep that in mind. So what I want to start with first is just give you a broad brush view of some of the challenges for achieving uh, high assurance in these AI-based systems. Um, and this is uh, essentially insights that 
uh, we published more than five years ago in this paper. Um, and I want to share this with you to give you a more global perspective of the problem before I, I zoom in on the specification matter. So here on this slide, we see the typical view of formal uh, verification, where you start with uh, the three inputs on the left, the system under verification S, the environment of that system E, and the specification phi. And then you are trying to ask if does uh, S when composed with E satisfy phi, and you ideally want a, a yes or no answer, right? Now, in the case of AI-based autonomy, the kinds of systems I talked about in the previous slide, um, the problem of environment modeling is a lot more challenging than it is for typical hardware and software, um, because in part, the, it's an open world, right? You don't know even how many agents and objects are in the environment, let alone have uh, good models of their behaviors. So that's one big challenge. The second challenge arises from the complexity of the systems themselves, which are complex in a way that it's, it's different from those conventional uh, verification methods have applied, been applied to, right? So you have these large deep neural networks with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of parameters. Um, and, um, uh, and they are really hybrid in nature. They have you know, sort of discrete and continuous behavior. Um, then you have the specification question, which is if, if you think about the ABS example, you have a neural network that must detect if something is a car, right? Detect if something is an obstacle that you need to avoid. And how do you even specify that? How do you specify that something is a car, right? So for example, does this picture look like a, a is it a picture of a car, right? And in fact, this one is a real uh, vehicle, right? A real car, but uh, mm -hmm. at first glance may not look that way. So even coming up with the inputs to the verification problem is hard. If somehow you can solve that obstacle and get, get on to the, to the verification, the actual algorithmic part, um, then you hit the usual complexity, except it's exacerbated by very high dimensional inputs and state spaces. So imagine you have streams of sensor data, high dimensional sensor data, like images, LIDAR, et cetera. Um, and you have to breeze in over that. Okay. Um, and so it may seem that just doing, uh, you know, a, a posterior verification is, is hard. We should try to do something a priori, but uh, even what, synthesis means, correct by construction synthesis means is yet to be fully defined in this area. There have been a number of efforts over the, whoops, I don't know how that happened. Let me go back to the slide. Uh, there we go. Okay, so I think I'm on the right slide now. Yeah, so even correct by construction synthesis requires a, a lot more uh, work in this field. Okay, so um, so back then, this is these are the four the five challenges that we put forth, right? Environment modeling, which includes modeling human behavior, uh, formal specification, modeling learning systems for the purposes of formal reasoning, uh, then scaling up algorithms for uh, design as well as verification, and then doing design for correctness, right? And in that paper, we also listed a bunch of principles which we've refined over the years, and the work that we've done on this topic is listed at this URL. So, um, um, you know, do, uh, if you have a chance, do read this and, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, today, I'm going to focus on item number two, which is formal specification. And really, it's uh, what I'd like to do today is share with you uh, my own understanding of the um, state of the art for formal specification of machine learning systems. So it's not so much as a presentation of the results that that uh, my group has obtained, but more of a survey of this area and uh, to share our understanding with you. Okay, so I wanna start out with, first of all, uh, a more uh, slightly more refined view of the challenge for formal specification. Um, then I'll, I'll talk about um, uh, component level specification, that is the types of specifications you want to write for machine learning models like neural networks. Um, then we'll do a slightly deeper dive into one class of specifications, which is robustness properties. We'll talk about the link between component level specifications and system level specifications. And at the end, I'll just touch upon very briefly environment modeling and, uh, and then come back to the principles for verified AI. Okay, so that's the plan for the next uh, 35 odd minutes. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about the challenges for formal specification of, of machine learning systems. All right, so the first challenge uh, is something I touched upon in that overview slide, which is uh, hard to formalize tasks. So if we think about it, many of the most impactful applications uh, of machine learning, uh, particularly deep learning, are in perceptual tasks. These are automating uh, 
uh, human perceptual tasks like vision or uh, uh, speech uh, recognition, natural language understanding, things like that. Okay, so coming back to this question I talked about earlier, imagine you have these three pictures. Um, they're all pictures of cars, right? But if your your uh, purpose is to is to train a, a neural network to recognize cars on the road for an autonomous vehicle, right? You certainly wanted to recognize that the leftmost picture as a car. The middle picture is is a cartoon vehicle that. Uh, uh, a child would recognize, right? But it's not necessarily the kinds of cars that you want the autonomous vehicle to be trained on. And then the one on the, the right, the one I showed you earlier, um, this is sort of a corner case, right? This is an actual vehicle decorated by somebody who used to be at Berkeley, but the, it would not typically be in a data set that, that you train cars on, right? So how do you even specify this? And I contend that you can actually not specify things like that, right? So, um, in that case, if you don't have a specification, what does verification even mean for uh, machine learning models used in these sorts of tasks? I mean, what specifications are meaningful here for hard to formalize tasks? Right? So this is our first challenge because you know we we have, as I talk about later, we have to do reasoning at the component level on these models. So if you want to do that reasoning, what are the specifications we have to use? Okay, here's challenge two. Okay, so there's uh, between the formal methods world and the machine learning world, there's a bit of an impedance mismatch, right? So on the left, you see uh, the formal methodist, right? Who speaks logic and automata uh, and things like that. Uh, typically we write Boolean specification also, although the trend in formal methods has also been moving towards quantitative, but largely it's Boolean specifications, which are for a given behavior, true or false, right? Um, on the, on the right-hand side, you see the machine learning person, right? Who's language of specifications is uh, things like cost functions or risk, reward, et cetera, right? These tend to be quantitative. So uh, there's some nice things about Boolean specifications. They're more composable. I can write two properties. I can, I can conjoin it. I can take the disjunction. I can build up more complex specifications that way. And there's of course the fit with formal tools, right? If you want to use, if you write a Boolean specification in logic, you can then use a model checker uh, to do some reasoning about it, for example. On the other side, quantitative specifications like cost functions can be more flexible, right? Because you can you have a more nuanced view of satisfaction. Um, and there's also a nice fit with optimization, which is of course central to machine learning, but also it's, uh, as we've seen in falsification, in runtime verification, optimization can be very effective at finding bugs, right? So the next challenge really is how do we bridge this gap between the Boolean specification world and the quantitative specification work. And we need to do this, in my opinion, uh, in order to make it effective for machine learning systems. And then the third challenge um, is uh, data versus formal specifications. So again, in the machine learning world, the way people specify things in addition to the cost function and risk uh, and so forth is just using labeled data, right? Or unlabeled data, right? You have you basically have data, data is the specification. That's your ground truth. Um, on the flip side in formal methods, we write specifications uh, using our usual formalism, right? Uh, temporal logic, uh, bookie automata, things like that. So again, this is yet another gap that we need to bridge. How do we go between uh, specifications that are provided as data and the kinds of specifications we need to use for formal reasoning? Okay, so those are the three challenges. I'm gonna come back to these at the end. Um, but now I'm gonna take a, 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 a kind of long detour into a survey of the kinds of properties that I think are really interesting and relevant for machine learning systems. Okay, so the question is what properties of machine learning systems must be ver verified? So um, if we look at a, a taxonomy of properties, there are really multiple dimensions here, right? So first of all, there's the system level versus the component level uh, the dimension. So uh, in, your, in my, uh, automatic emergency braking system example, the deep neural network was one component in a bigger system. And typically your, your, your specification is really on the overall system, right? I want my overall system to be safe. Um, I want the car to get from point A to point B, right? In a timely fashion, right? So those are my overall system level specifications. Um, versus in some other cases, it may be at the component level, okay? So that's one, uh, one dimension. 
The other dimension is directly relevant to this workshop, right? Which is trace properties versus hyper properties. So there are some uh, properties which are perhaps simpler trace properties that we can we, we we have studied for longer. We have more mature tools and methods, and the others are hyper properties which are relatively newer. Uh, the third dimension is whether the boolean versus quantitative, right? Depending on the context, different uh, of these may make sense. Sometimes both. And finally, is the next is the purpose, right? So what do you want the system to do? What do you want it to be? Do you want it to be robust to attacks? Do you want it to be safe? Do you want it to, to behave in a fair way, right? So there's different purposes. So these are at least four dimensions along which you can classify properties. So what I wanna do in the next couple of minutes is just give you examples of uh, different combinations of these attributes, right? So I'm gonna focus on the first three here, right? So you've got like two times two times two, you've got eight, combinations possible, and I think all of them are meaningful. I'm just going to give you a few examples of these. Okay, so first let's look at a system level Boolean trace property, right? So this is again going back to my example from before of the automated emergency braking system, right? So everything is the same as I, as I said before. And here you might have a property uh, which is a trace property, and it's a Boolean property, and it's specified in a logic like metric temporal logic or signal temporal logic. So here you're saying something like, uh, always while the autonomous vehicle is moving, the distance between the AV, so that's the AV position and some environment object, there's some, let's assume there's one environment object, right? Um, is at least a minimum threshold delta, right? So that's the kind of pro property you would write in, in uh, a temporal logic, a standard temporal logic. Um, and this is actually a reasonable property for this class of systems, right? Um, so uh, that's an example of a system level Boolean trace property on a machine learning system. In fact, the fact that it even uses a machine learning component is, is sort of not relevant here. The property is on the global system. It's over the variables of these components, the environment and the plant, right? Okay, let's look at a component level Boolean trace property, right? So here I have something that looks very similar, except now I have end-to-end -end control, right? So this is the kind of thing that uh, a lot of people uh, have been and were, especially was more popular a few years ago to do end-to-end -end, uh, control going from sensor data all the way to control inputs of autonomous vehicles, right? Um, so you've got your image X and you, then you have your control input Y. And what you might like here is some kind of a input output robustness property. So what you might wanna say is for a given uh, input image X, X1, and for uh, constants epsilon and delta, and then for all other x2, such that x2 is closed within an epsilon, uh, uh, you know, depending on the norm, right, within some epsilon uh, neighborhood of x1, uh, for all such x2, you want the, the difference between the control outputs on those two to be bounded by delta. Right. So basically what it's saying is if my image changed only a little bit, then I don't expect my control to change drastically. Right. So this is sort of the standard input of robustness property, well studied and control. And this is an example of the kind of property that you might want to write now at the component level. Right. Uh, but it also has a Boolean nature to it. OK. Um, let's look at a component level. Uh, Boolean hyper property. Right. So here's a, another very common example used in deep learning. Right? So imagine you have a deep neural network that is used to assign some kind of a rating to applicants for loans. So your input here is a feature vector, which is uh, capturing the loan application. Um, and the output here is the rating assigned to it. Okay, so think of a numerical rating. Um, and so now the neural network itself is this function f of f parameterized by weight vector w. And uh, you might have a property like this, right? So what this property is saying is that uh, take two feature vectors, x1, x2. Let's imagine they have, this is an application vector. So imagine there's a salary attribute, right? So you've got the salary of x2 um, is at least as much as the salary of x1, right? So what you expect here is that from the rating perspective, x2 is rated at least as high as x1, right? Um, that is the, the risk of x2 is lower than x1 it's rated higher, all right? So this is a, what is a, a, a considered as a, as a monotonicity property, which uh, is, is one of the examples of, of component level properties that are desirable in some contexts. 
And you'll notice that this is really over a pair of inputs, right? So even though this is this is not a, a reactive system in the sense of running forever, so it's just a transformational system, but it's really a, a property over a pair of inputs to this to this program, right? Which is a neural network. And so this is an example of a very simple component level Boolean hyperproperty. All right. Um, okay. And then let me give you an example of a system level quantitative property, which can either be a trace property or a hyper property, depending on your, uh, your particular uh, viewpoint. So this is a, a very uh, popular toy example. Uh, first, a classic example, you know, first proposed by Barto et al. in an uh, 83 paper on reinforcement learning. And now uh, part of the library of OpenAI Gym, the cart pole balancing problem where the task is, you know, as the cart moves, this is inverted pendulum and it has to balance it and keep it upright, okay, within some threshold. So uh, in this, in the specification of the problem, it's a discrete time problem. So every step uh, you get a reward of one uh, if at that step, the cart, uh, the pole is kept upright, right? Um, and, uh, and so if you look at a finite length trace, so finite time uh, horizon trace, uh, where the time horizon is capital T, um, then the overall cumulative reward is simply the sum of the rewards over that horizon little t going from one to capital T, right? So you can think of this cumulative reward for a given trace as the quantitative specification value for that trace, right? So for that trace, you may say, I, for, for every trace, I want the reward to be at least so, okay? So that's one, one thing to write down. So that gives you a system level quantitative trace property. Um, but you might be interested in something that's over an ensemble of traces, right? And you want the whole system to work so over the set of all possible behaviors of the system, okay, calligraphic T, um, you want the, let's say the, the worst case uh, uh, value. And that, that's a measure of how good the system is, right? So you look at the infimum over all traces in capital T uh, of the cumulative reward over that little, over that trace little tau, okay? So that's, uh, an example of a quantitative hyper property. And this is a system level property because it's really depending on the, the dynamics and the model of the entire system. Okay, so that's an example from using a very simple deep reinforcement learning approach for this classic cut, cut pole balancing problem. All right, so I just give you four examples and really my, my, in my uh, exploration of this topic, I think all, all combinations are possible here, right? So um, but it's you know that obviously the, uh, it really depends on the on the on the system what's what makes what is meaningful. Okay, so um, uh, so now let's look at the purpose dimension, right? So um, at the system level, I, my experience has been that the specifications are very similar to other kinds of systems, the non-ML systems. So you have the same properties, the same type of safety, liveness, stability, and so on properties. At the component level, when you have the machine learning models and components, the properties can be a little different. So robustness properties, uh, like the one I showed you before, are very popular, well-studied. We're gonna spend uh, five, 10 minutes talking about this soon. Um, input output relations, this is another one that people have looked at, where you say, uh, if your input to the neural network lies in this region, then the output should lie in this other region. Um, Monotonicity property, which we saw this earlier. Fairness, I'll talk about this uh, soon. There are coverage properties, which is uh, things like uh, I want, uh, it's, a, it's a property over um, how well a neural network, uh, how, how, how uh, the, the, the structure of the neural network responds to inputs, right? So whether particular neurons are activated by inputs or not, um, but there are other different types of coverage metrics as well. Semantic invariance, which is basically saying that you don't expect the input to change to certain transformations of the input. Distributional assumptions, which is basically capturing assumptions that uh, uh, certain machine learning algorithms make uh, in order to guarantee, give guarantees, right? So you wanna be able to write those kinds of assumptions down and, and a few others. And I want to mention that uh, 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 all of these property classes were surveyed in a paper that appeared at ATWA three years ago. Um, the other kinds of specifications that I find quite interesting in this domain and perhaps less well studied are not properties of the models or the systems themselves. They are properties of the algorithms that you use to design those models, like training algorithms. So for instance, stochastic gradient descent, which is the workhorse of training for neural networks, right? 
um, there's been some initial work on trying to characterize properties of those um, and then prove properties about, about the algorithms themselves or the implementations of those algorithms where numerical uh, issues are relevant, okay? So that's a class that I won't say very much about, but I think it's, a, it's also an interesting class of specifications. Okay, so let me talk very briefly about fairness and then I'll dive into robustness. Um, so um, in our survey that we've seen three broad, uh, broad flavors of fairness, although you know, fairness for machine learning is a topic that many others have written much more extensively on and there's lots of variants of even these three broad flavors. So the first one is what I call as, um, uh, as what is, has been known in the literature as individual or similarity-based fairness. And the, the view here is that you look at the machine learning model operating on individual inputs. And the property is you want to say that similar inputs are mapped to similar outputs. So it's actually very similar to the robustness property we saw earlier, right? If you have two inputs vectors that are close to each other in some space, then you expect that the, the, the machine learning model behaves similarly on them. Okay, so it's fair in that sense. The second class is what are called group or population-based fairness. So here you're taking the view of the machine learning model operating over a large population of data, and uh, you have uh, properties like this, right? Which say that um, over this population, the property of getting a particular output value is independent of certain features, okay? So this, this particular example is called demographic parity, but there are other examples of these group-based fairness properties. And then the final property, uh, class of properties are counterfactual fairness properties, which where the uh, setting is that you have a machine learning model and you say, well, uh, the decision of this model should be the same, uh, whether I operate it in, on, in the actual environment or in some counterfactual environment where I change something about the input uh, distribution or the, the, the input space in which this is operating, okay? So, so that's a, a different ways where you're looking at the context of the model as opposed to uh, the operation of the model on individual inputs or groups of inputs, okay? So uh, again, as I mean, I'm not getting into the details here, but there are, uh, are non-deterministic versions of this and probabilistic versions of this. In fact, the group-based fairness properties, I would say are very relevant for hyper properties. Um, so in our ATVA paper, we point out that uh, the demographic parity uh, at least the non-probabilistic version of that is very much a non-interference property. Um, so, um, so that's in, for people in the hyperproperties world, I think this might be a good class of uh, specifications to look at. All right, so um, let's talk about robustness now for the next uh, few minutes, and then I'll, I'll have uh, another five minutes to conclude. Okay, so uh, what is robustness? Well, we've all seen pictures like this, right? So this is the whole area of adversarial machine learning where uh, you take an input, uh, you add some noise to it, and you change, you can change the label, even though the, the visually the input has not changed, right? Uh, to a human, this looks the same. Um, people have done this um, not only with uh, synthetically generated images like this, but also with real, so, you know, 3D printing of models, take a, an actual photograph with a, with a camera, and you can fool, uh, you can fool a neural network uh, into things like uh, misclassifying a turtle as a rifle, right? Um, so what's happening in all these cases is that uh, these are all instances of what is called the local robustness or a, or a violation of the local robustness property, okay? And this also, they're also known as adversarial machine learning test time attacks because the attack is being carried out at the time where you evaluate the model, okay? So the, the general setup here is you're given an input X to a model, you want to find a perturbation, a small perturbation X star that produces an incorrect output, okay? And if no such perturbation is possible, then you say the machine learning model is robust to this particular test time attack. In fact, the more precisely, it's locally robust around that input X, okay? Um, the problem that we saw here is that in the literature, there's a huge literature, literally a zoo of uh, different, uh, you know, hundreds of papers, and many of them use different definitions of uh, what is a perturbation and when does that adversary succeed and all of that. So, um, so two years ago, two, but two and a half years ago, we, we decided to uh, try to come up with a framework that captures as many of these variants as possible. So this is what is presented in the paper cited at the bottom. Um, so the general template for a local robustness property is given here on the slide. 
So you're given an input X in the input space and a neural network or a machine learning model that maps input space to output space. The goal is to find an adversarial example X star which satisfies three properties. The first one we call the admissibility constraint, which basically says that X star must lie in a, uh, in a set X tilde, which are the allowed uh, adversarial examples. The second is the distance constraint, which is basically saying that it must be close to the original input X, right? According to some metric with some parameter alpha. And the third one is the target behavior constraint, which is basically saying what the adversary wants to achieve. So the adversary wants to have some behavior uh, of X star relative to X with some parameter beta. Okay, we'll see where these parameters alpha and beta are used. So the, again, admissibility constraint says only valid perturbations are allowed. Distance constraint says perturb within a specified distance. And the last one is the goal of the adversary. And this is sort of the decision problem formulation of local robustness, okay? So if no such adversarial example exists, we say it is locally robust with respect to these uh, predicates. Okay, now in the literature, people more commonly use optimization variants of this, of this local robustness property. So for instance, they'll, you have this problem and then they'll say, we want to minimize the perturbation. So basically you want to find the smallest alpha, which is the bound on the distance between uh, the original input and the perturbed input such that some constraint holds. In this case, this is the adversary goal, right? So here it's saying that the label should change, but really it's it's the adversary constraint, okay? Um, so that's one very common optimization formulation. The other common formulation is to maximize the loss. So what you say is there's some loss function and uh, I want to maximize it. So the, the, dif the, the uh, difference in the loss going from uh, the output on X to the output on X prime should exceed beta but under the constraint that prime is close to X, right? So those are two common uh, goals. So now I wanna show you in the next few slides the, how this framework captures many common uh, instances of adversarial analysis. So here, this is one that's the minimum perturbation uh, with targeted attacks. So the picture here shows what's going on. So you have your additional input X, um, you, you want to only search a bounded neighborhood, bounded by alpha, but you want to find uh, X star, which produces a specific output Y. You want to hit a specific output Y in the output space, right? So I want to switch Panda to Gibbon, right? So Gibbon is my target and I want to hit that particular out output value. So here you can see in the decision problem, what's happening is you're picking this small R where it's uh, uh, you know, P norm bounded by alpha, such that the output is Y. And then the optimization formulation pretty much follows the same type of thing. Okay, this captures a whole slew of papers in the adversarial ML literature. Okay, um, there's another set of papers that look at pretty much the same problem, except it's untargeted attacks. That is, the only thing that, that differs is that instead of a specific Y, you just want to hit any point different from the original label, right? So I don't care what I get, Right. I've, I've got my initial image is, is turtle, label is turtle. I want to flip it to something else, right? Doesn't matter what it is. Um, so the, all that changes is the adversary constraint, right? So I think one of the things that you can get by understanding the space in this way is that, you know, uh, if only one component of the definition of the property changes, a lot of the techniques for adversarial attacks or even robustness may actually be reusable depending on what component of the problem changes, right? Okay, so here's uh, another example. This is uh, the example where instead of minimum perturbation, we're going after maximum loss and uh, you're still doing untargeted attacks, right? So the, the, here the adversary goal is that the adversary wants to make the, the loss function, in this case, the, the loss function exceed uh, beta. And so here's your, so imagine the, this is showing the, how the loss function evol evolves as a function of, X, um, here's your original loss value, right? And you look at some, oh, epsilon should be alpha here. So you look at some alpha region of this and you want to find uh, something that maximizes the loss, okay? Going from X to X star. So that's an example of the kinds of things that um, were done in this paper by um, Alex Madri and colleagues. Um, then there's been another class of attacks where they look at adversarial examples, robust to transformations. So here, 
the the idea here is that you have a set of transformations like geometric transformations like translation rotation etc of an image and um what you want to do here is that you so you're you're looking at uh the expectation over the transformation space that the distance between the transformed input the, i'm sorry this is between the original input the trans and the and the perturbed input should be bounded by alpha even when you transform them right so i take my original input i trans i perturb it and now if i if i do scaling or or uh, translation and so on i still want that uh that uh, the the proximity to hold right and similarly i have a, a similar uh, uh constraint over the over the loss in this case so this is this you know pretty much the same type of um template works here of course that you have a more probabilistic version of it right because we are looking at uh, assuming that adversary can has a distribution over what transformations they can apply and then you're computing the expectation with respect to that um as a constraint okay and the last one i'll mention is input output relations this is something that's very common in the formal methods literature for this area where uh, a lot of tools have looked at uh what happens if i look at a region containing my input x and i want to find an x star in that region that produces an output that's outside a valid output set s out right so i start an s in i want to go outside s out okay and so that also fits the template that we have where you have uh these three admissibility distance and and uh an adversarial constraint okay great so uh if you look at our, our vnn19 paper we have a big table i've shown a part of that table here which has all the different types of adversaries and you know classified along these dimensions um and um uh you can i in in our in our view in our experience we can put pretty much any of these attacks into this framework okay so um even even doing that there are still some questions that remain right so first of all in adversarial machine learning in this formulation of robustness uh one of the things is emphasized is i want to take an original input and add a very small amount of noise so i'm looking for an an uh, x star which is close to x right a small perturbation um and also i'm adding noise according to some synthetic model so the first question is is this realistic can these actually occur and secondly um you're only looking at small perturbations here but even big perturbations are a problem right i mean you can even have large perturbations in the pixel space that uh, can lead to undesirable output and we uh, and we want to be able to catch those right so how do we deal with these uh questions how do we address these questions so um our view is we need to move from the most syntactic version of robustness that a lot of the adversarial ml literature has looked at to a more semantic version and i think this is where formal methods can really play a big role so um this is uh what we consider as the semantic robustness property so let me describe to you what that is so you have your standard uh picture here of a a, a neural network going from x to y but if you think about pixels they're really coming from some underlying semantic feature space right so if you see a picture or scene of of a car on a road well there's actually the car there's a time of day there's a type of road the region that's it, it it's in the time, the weather at the time and so on that if you have a, a renderer that can capture all of that it can then produce a concrete image right it's coming from some rendering process from some underlying semantic feature space and what we really care about ultimately <clears throat> is semantic robustness that is if i take two points little s and little s prime in this space and uh, from those two points i render x and x prime what i would like is my outputs on those two x and x prime to be close even though x and x prime themselves may not be close right it may be a large distance in the pixel space but it might be pretty much the same uh image of a car on a road except the car model has changed or the car color has changed right um so um what we've seen in our experience uh, working on this is joint work with somesh ja and our students that we can apply techniques from standard adversarial analysis to this problem provided this renderer is uh, differentiable and here's an example of our results so if you look here the top image this is an, an image which is rendered Uh, from this rendered from this uh, virtual kitty data set um of a bunch of cars parked on the street 
Um, and we are able to produce images like this, where you see it's it's pretty much the same uh, as the one on the top, except that this car's color has been changed to about the same shade of gray as the background. And now you see the bounding box on this car is gone. So basically the neural network is not able to detect the car that's closest to the camera, right? Um, now in pixel space, this is a big change, but in the semantic feature space, it's a relatively small change. Um, so semantic robustness, I think, is a really important property uh, that uh, the, the community needs to do more, more, more work on. Okay, um, very quickly, let me talk about this question here, which is um, robustness of ML models tends to be um, a component level property. But what we ultimately care about is the impact of this at the system level, right? Like, th does it make the car crash, right? And so for this sort of system, I'm not really interested in verifying properties at the component level because that is meaningless in this case if I don't have a good formal specification, right? I want to verify the system level property. And that is this temporal logic property that I showed you earlier, right? Which doesn't really mention uh, any, anything about the neural networks inputs and outputs. Okay, so, so just a one slide uh, uh, summary of, uh, this is uh, some, uh, a topic on which we did work uh, four years ago on taking approaches in simulation-based verification of CPS and uh, showing how you can apply this in a compositional fashion. And the principles we use are the classic principles for normal methods. We use abstraction to try to abstract the, the complex neural network by a simpler surrogate function and compositional reasoning, which is we uh, sort of do a two-level reasoning where we reason about the system level where the neural network has been replaced by the simpler abstraction and then use that analysis to derive a component level constraint where you can do adversarial analysis on the neural network and then uh, iterate between the two if necessary. Okay, and so uh, the main takeaway from this work was, I think it was one of the first to show that all misclassifications uh, are not equal, right? So we found in this case, we were able to change things like the position of the, of the car on the road, the brightness of the image and produce lots of misclassifications of images like this. I mean, you could argue they're all adversarial examples, but uh, in this case, the they would not it would not lead to a system level failure. That is, the the braking system would not cause the car to collide with this with this obstacle vehicle. On the other hand, there are some misclassifications like this uh, corner case image, where the car is closer, driving slightly on the wrong side of the road, and that is a real hazard in the system level. So what you want really is in this case is to have the system level specification. And that determines whether something is safe or not safe, but then use that to derive component level constraints so that you can scale up the analysis to these sorts of complex uh, neural network based models. All right, so just to conclude now, I want to revisit the challenges um, very briefly. So the, the first challenge was the hard to formalize tasks. And the principle that we've been using is you start with a formalizable system level spec, like the one I just talked about, um, and then derive component level properties from that. Um, and that I think is is a way to deal with the these components that are used for perception that themselves don't have very meaningful properties. Uh, for the second challenge, I think we really need to move to formalisms that are hybrid in nature, that where you can sort of move between Boolean and quantitative worlds. And uh, I think the formal methods community has already been doing work on this. So um, there are temporal logics with quantitative semantics, MTL, STL, etc. There's also been nice work on uh, ways to organize multiple specifications, both Boolean and quantitative in a single uh, formalism where you can, you can give priorities between them. So this, this idea of rule books um, and so on. And then finally, the, the, I didn't talk very much about this at all in this, in this uh, talk today, uh, to bridge the gap between data and formal specifications, I think uh, we should leverage all the work on specification mining that, that our community has been doing. Um, and so a couple of examples are uh, work that uh, uh, my student Marcel, as well as uh, Jyotir Maideshmuk and others, and Kalin Belta and many others have been doing on this area on learning properties from data, which is a way for us to go between uh, the language that the, the learning people speak and the language that we speak. All right. Um, and then the last thing very briefly I want to mention is that uh, Sometimes we think about specifications as also including the specification of the environment. Right? I tend to, to split this up because I think environment modeling is, 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 uh, has its own complexity. 
but it's also part of the specification problem because it's specifying the, the behavior of the environment as well as things like distributional assumptions. Um, and this is where uh, uh, we've been doing work on devising languages where you can model the environment. And for machine learning systems, I think probabilistic modeling is crucial uh, if you're going to be able to, to, to give any reason, meaningful guarantees. So, so Scenic is this language that Daniel Fremont led the design of. It's a probabilistic programming language um, that you can use to model scenarios, environments for uh, um, autonomous systems. Um, and so here's examples of Scenic. This is the static version on the left, modeling a badly parked car. Um, this is the, the dynamic version on the right, where it's the same badly parked car example, but now extended the behaviors for the ego vehicle, as well as the, the vehicle that is badly parked that pulls into its path as it approaches. So um, uh, I, don't, I don't have time today to talk uh, more about Scenic, but, um, but uh, we have a lot of material online if you're interested in learning about it. Um, Scenic is paired with this open source toolkit. So both of these, both Scenic and Verify are open source uh, toolkits uh, for uh, design analysis of AI-based systems. And I just want to highlight that in, in Verify, we took a very um, conscious decision to let the specification be multimodal. That is, you can write temporal logic properties if you want, you can write objective functions, you can mix these together. You can actually have multiple properties organized as a rule book and be able to do reasoning uh, with respect to that. Okay. Um, so it's, I think it's a, it's a nice, uh, these tools potentially are a nice playground for us to connect uh, work on specification for hyper properties, as well as um, other kinds of reasoning tools for AI based systems. Okay, so with that, I want to conclude here. Um, uh, if I can take one more minute, I'll just go quickly through this slide and give you a view of the, of the landscape uh, and things that I didn't get time to talk about today. So on the left here, are, these are the five challenges I talked about at the very beginning. Um, for environment modeling, um, as I mentioned, I think probabilistic modeling is really important for these class of systems, but um, th there are a few other strategies that we also need. For instance, um, for things like modeling human behavior, um, it's hard to come up with these like a, from a first principles, uh, you know, write it by hand manner. So you often need to learn models from data and then, uh, but integrate them with, uh, with results from psychology and cognitive science about, about human modeling. Um, and then sometimes we need to be introspective about how we model the environment. That is, uh, just extract an assumptions that the system makes about the environment in an algorithmic fashion. Uh, specification, I talked about this a lot today already. Uh, for modeling learning systems, I think we need to do, we need to come up with new ways to abstract learning components and also model their operation at the semantic level. That is, they you know, how they, they change the semantic feature space as opposed to the, the more concrete feature space. Uh, for efficiency reasons, I think we have to go to composition analysis. I think we understand this well in formal methods, but also I think uh, we, should, uh, we should do semantic uh, modeling in this case also. Like modeling something at the semantic feature space and doing the reasoning at that space makes it a lot more scalable than if you're if you're trying to scale up things over uh, a neural network that, op that operates over pixels or other raw sensor inputs. And then finally, for uh, design for correctness and synthesis, uh, there's two uh, areas that I think need, need, we need to make progress on. One is uh, oracle guided learning, where you pair the learning algorithm with, an, with oracles of different types. And the other is runtime assurance, uh, where uh, we do runtime monitoring and um, uh, and have fallback, safe fallback options. So with that, uh, that's all I have today. Uh, thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take questions if there are any and if you have time for them. Thanks, Sanjit. Uh, I have a question which is more general, so I think we'll save it to the panel, but does anyone else have a quick question? Uh, hey, Sanjit, this is Joe here. Uh, quick question. Uh, so uh, uh, one thing I, I feel like... Uh, uh, you uh, you mentioned is explanations. Uh, so I, I think, I mean, even specifications can have some role in explainability. Do you have a comment on that? Sure, yeah. Um, so I uh, I won't use the term explanation uh, probably in a, in, in a, I'm using it in a two-fold uh, manner. So the first is, I think, how a lot of people read it, which is in the sense of interpretability, right? So I, uh, I have this complex neural network. I want to now write us uh, extract the specification for it that a human can understand. Um, and I think uh, that uh, 
you know, formal specifications could play a role there, mainly from a composability standpoint, because, you know, since the formal specification, you can break it into little components and you can sort of explain them. You, uh, a human could explain, could understand them um, more easily just because of the compositional nature. Uh, but I think what, what I feel is a more um, impact, potentially impactful interpretation of explainability is more that uh, it's not really in the in sense of human understandability, but more in the sense of analyzability, right? So, I, I mean, if I, if I can extract, if I have a model of a neural network as an automaton, uh, then it's potentially easier to analyze it, to apply formal tools to it, than if I had to deal with the, the like the, the uh, recurrent neural network directly. So, uh, so this term explanation that I'm using here on this slide uh, is really in that, in, in sort of both senses, right? And particularly with emphasis on the second sense, because to deal with the complexity of learning systems, if we can generate a more explainable or inter interpretable inter inter interpretation, then I think it makes it the, the reasoning downstream easier. That's, yeah, so that's, that's basically what I wanted to say there. All right, thanks, Sanjit. Uh, let's take a break now. We're running a little behind. I wanna make sure we have at least a five minute break so people can go to the restroom or anything. So let's start again at 1048, which is in just over five minutes from now. Okay, See you thank all you. There.